Yes, okay. Um, let's, um, let's start then. It's um, 31 minutes past two, so I think we will start. Um, very welcome to this um, seminar, uh, webinar. Um, Yes, very welcome to this, um, this webinar about recognition of prior learning with the topic why validation and recognition of prior and informal and non-formal learning. Uh, my name is Anders Alstrand and I work as an analyst at the Swedish Council for Higher Education in Sweden. And um, I will, um, will be your host for, for the next one and a half hour. Sorry. Yes. And this is the program. Um, during the webinar, we will introduce some aspects on the question why higher education institutions should work with validation and recognition of prior learning. We will start with some context setting and, and some formal aspects. Uh, we will continue on to, um, to overview of uh, the nat some national context and end with the panel discussion. But we will start um, with a with poll. Um, we are about 160 participants from 29 countries. Um, and uh, we would like to know a little bit more about you before we continue on. So um, we have launched the poll with the two questions. If you could um, just answer them. We'll see uh, who you are. Okay, there are a lot of answers coming in. I think we could uh, could stop there and uh, and show the results. Yes. Um, so, educational professionals, um, the majority, and when it comes to the extent you worked with uh, recognition of prior learning. It seems to be uh, a fairly uh, experienced um, lot. Um, okay, do we have a question uh, right now? Uh, Cecilia Georgia has raised her hand. I don't know if we could uh, use that. You should um, write questions in the uh, Q&A and um, maybe add comments or whatnot in, in the comments uh, in, in the chat. But um, it's good to know a little bit more about you, 160 uh, registered and uh, not that many actually um, started um, the, um, the webinar, 110 I can see. But a, a good spread from, from a lot of European countries and even non-European countries. So um, to get this uh, square out of your screen, you just click it and you could minimize it. Okay, um, like I said, um, to ask questions to, um, to speakers uh, and to panelists later on, uh, use the Q&A and, uh, and then uh, we have the, um, the chat for, for more comments. I can see for instance that uh, there's a comment or a question, are you going to send the presentations to the participants and yes, um, uh, we, we, we are, um, we're going to publish them and we're also going to, um, this is filmed so it's going to be published on the, the Russia YouTube uh, channel uh, later on. So um, this webinar is given in the context of a EU funded uh, project called RPL in Practice. It's funded through the support um, by the European Commission um, uh, that the, the EU uh, gives to um, the implementation of the Bologna reform, uh, that is the, uh, the creation of the uh, 
European higher education area. The Swedish Minister of Education is the contractor and it has given the Swedish Council for Higher Education the task to, to coordinate the, the project. It's a two year program uh, or contract period. And if you follow these links later on when you get the presentations, you can read a little bit, um, a little bit more about the project. The, the objective of the, the project is to promote different ways of recognizing competences for access to further studies and for credits. The objective is to encourage through structured peer learning the participating countries and institutions to develop uh, quality assured and consistent processes to recognize non-formal and informal learning that suits the condition in the participating country or institution. The um, participants in this project you see here on the screen, um, there uh, are ministries, higher education institutions, uh, authorities in five countries involved, and also uh, Russia. When we um, initiated this project, um, we wanted to involve countries that were in the process of implementing or developing their validation practices, and also countries that were on different levels of, uh, of implement implementation. The idea is to learn from one another, so the peer learning component in this project is, is, um, is, is big and uh, we also want to spread that uh, to others. And there is a lot to learn from, uh, from each other. In the project we come from different um, higher education systems, uh, we have different laws and regulations um, which leads to um, different challenges. Um, but in the end the basic question is fairly similar. When you look at the question, why uh, validation and recognition of prior and inform prior informal and non-formal learning, you can look at it from the individual's point of view, the higher education point of view, employers, society, etc. You will probably get different answers. The, the answers will probably differ depending on whom you ask, whether they represent a higher education institution or, or is an employer, for instance. Um, and the answer you get would probably also uh, differ depending on whom within different kinds of organizations you ask. Uh, depending on whom you ask within the higher education institution, what kind of higher education institution it is. We won't be able to give answers from all these angles during this, um, this webinar, but at least we will uh, touch upon a, a few of them. In the simplest form, the question um, could be answered in this way. Uh, nobody should be required to study something that they already know. That's sort of the essence in, in uh, recognition of prior learning. So during this webinar, we'll give a little bit more complex picture than, than this answer, uh, of course. And we will, we will start by looking at a short video from one of our um, project um, partners which shows some reasons why uh, one should work with um, uh, recognition of prior learning. I will just start that. Now you probably actually have to ask right out, do you hear this? No. Please comment. No, no, Anders, we don't hear No, it. okay, I will stop it, sorry. Thank you, I will stop sharing. And you usually get a question if I should share the, the sound as well. So I will do this again, sorry for this mishap. <clears throat> There we go. This is better, right? Yes, yes. Thank you. 
RPL allows us to uh, recognise and acknowledge uh, formal and non-formal and work-based learning that a learner brings to CIT uh, as part of their completion of a programme. There's an increasing emphasis on the provision of education and the need to attain formalised education and that I would suggest for example is one of the key roles that RPL and RPEL would have in the context for example of social change. I chose RPL for the reason the recession had just hit and I wanted to get better at what I wanted to do. I availed of RPL because um, in the first semester I realised in subjects like plant science and botany that I'd already covered a lot of the course material um, and I knew that as a mature student who'd been away from school quite a long time and away from subjects like maths that I could really do with the extra time to catch up with those. RPL certainly supports the needs of lifelong learners in that uh, people who would have come through education systems maybe 10-15 years ago find that their qualifications are no longer valid. For over 20 years CIT has remained committed to both lifelong learners and recognition of prior learning. In CIT we have a working RPL policy which allows us to engage with industry and to engage with learners to ensure that all of their learning is captured. The experience was great. The staff were very friendly and very helpful. We had a coordinator between CIT and Flextronics and they advised us on the positive sides of the RPL and it was absolutely great and in any help we needed we got it. And it's what you put in is what you get out because if you're prepared to do that in your study you're going to do that in the working world. The advice I'd pass on to anyone considering RPL would be to not just look at any courses or degrees that you've held but anything, any kind of interests or hobbies or things that you've been involved, involved in in your life because um, you know you should really value the the experiences that you bring as a mature student to college. So somebody who's older, more experienced, um, more patient, has more common sense, they tend to put the learning experience with all of those qualities and it has a settling effect on those around them. And when you look back on how many people's lives were changed for the better, you think, well, that's a good thing to have. RPL is a good thing to have. Okay, um, well, we heard some uh, perspectives um, and now we would like to hear um, your opinion. Um, in your view, um, which of the following would be described as the main drivers for RPL at your institution or in your country? Um, it's for us to, to learn a little bit more uh, about how you see these and also for us to, to put into to the, the um, uh, to the panel later on today. So uh, please have a look at these questions and you can have two options. Okay, hey, um, let's see. Providing better access and inclusion in higher education, strengthening lifelong learning and employability. Okay, yes, these are the two main um, drivers. Um, not much on recruiting a sufficient pool of students. You probably have uh, um, enough students anyway. Okay, but this is good. We will come back to this, um, to your answers on this later on in the um, in the panel. So we'll um, continue. Um, one angle, uh, well, another angle <laughs> to, to look at the why question is the point of view um, of agreements, um, and. Um, Within the Bologna process, for instance, uh, recognition of prior learning has been on the agenda for some time. Uh, it came up on the agenda when the ministers of education met in Berlin in 2003 and has been readdressed several times since. And uh, most recently in the, um, 
in the meeting of the ministers of education in Paris to 2018. In, in my view, um, if there's a need to emphasize an issue after it's been uh, on the agenda for 15 years, it, it is a sign that not enough has, is being done. And um, the um, Bologna implementation po uh, report, uh, well, the latest one, uh, also state that um, there is a gap between policy and practice um, and only five education systems have nationally established um, and regularly monitored procedures, guidelines of policy for assessment and recognition of prior learning, both for accessing higher education and for allocation of credits towards qualification. So there seems to be um, uh, some things to do And um, the EU is also concerned uh, about um, RPL. It's, uh, it's high on the agenda. And um, the European Council adopted a recommendation in 2012 stating that the member states should have in place no later than 2018 arrangements for the validation of non-formal and informal learning. And this has, of course, led to um, a, a lot of activities in the member states. Um, uh, in Sweden, for instance, but also in, 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 other, in other countries. And just as a um, reality check, um, we will actually ask you one last question. Um, how well has the council recommendation been implemented in your country? So uh, fully, partly, not at all, I don't know. So if you could please answer that. Um, It's um, not many answer fully, um, but maybe it's difficult also to, um, to define what is fully. Okay, I think we could, uh, can stop there. Um, we have some, some participants from outside um, the EU and they uh, obviously can't, um, can't implement them. Um, but it's interesting to, to see that 34% uh, answers, uh, I don't know. And um, I'm, not, uh, I'm not completely surprised by that because there, are, there seems to be a lot uh, more to be done in, in this area. So maybe the, it, it's not that well known either. Okay, in, in the project, um, RPL in practice, we have used the four phases of validation outlined in the um, council recommendation and uh, which is also developed in the uh, CDFOP guidelines. We've used that as a, as a starting point, these four phases. Um, the CDFOP uh, guidelines were developed uh, to support the implementation of the council recommendation and uh, it's, um, it's uh, mostly directed towards um, uh, vocational training. Uh, and not everything is directly transferable to a high, uh, higher education vocabulary. Um, does the CDFOP uh, guidelines work for higher education? Does it need to be adopted for uh, HE needs? What has to be in place in the different phases? Uh, which are the fundamental building blocks in order to implement RPL um, practices? Um, these are the questions that we're focused on um, in this project. We, um, in the project, we've had three peer learning events and uh, we discussed definition, basic principles uh, uh, and a lot of uh, experience sharing. And above all, we focused on the basic prerequisites on RPL. And um, these are a couple of the points which we have found very important or we have all agreed are important. Um, transparent procedures and guidelines, supporting guidelines for students, committed and well-informed staff, um, institutional and program level commitment and policy, um, learning outcomes oriented uh, curricula, which consider RPL and the course development, appropriate uh, uh, funding, uh, etc. And these are things that we will hear a little bit uh, uh, more about uh, soon, um, because within this um, project, we also 
um, started up by doing a, a small survey among the project participants uh, in order to, to see what kind of challenges um, we could see. And later on, we also opened up uh, that survey to, um, to, to a wider pub public. And um, now Michel Kapisek, the Secretary General of Russia, will, uh, will present the, um, the results of that survey. And he will also share some of the challenges which um, Russia see, sees in this. So uh, please, Michel, we'll stop share. The floor is yours. Thanks, Anders. Uh, just have to start. Yep. Hope it works. Well, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I will try to briefly go through uh, the, the results of the survey, but as you said, uh, there will be few starting uh, words about Eurasia and the background and why we joined the, the project, because uh, we see the flexibility of learning and the recognition agenda as one of the crucial things for the future. Uh, it's great to see that during your presentation, the number of participants has increased uh, to 122. So I hope that I will keep the attention and uh, will not uh, result in a substantial decrease of, uh, of the participations. There are more things to be said uh, later on. Just to be brief, uh, Eurasia is the European uh, policy representation of professional higher education. And when we say professional higher education, we mean the institutions which subscribe to the definition in which we say that uh, whatever we do, this is type of edu higher education in which whatever we do, we are closely consulting that with the world of work as the main uh, stakeholder. Obviously not neglecting the students, not neglecting the academics, but uh, our main focus would be sort of on closer link to the world of work, including the strategy, including learning and teaching, including uh, research and uh, strong engagement with the regional communities. Uh, this is just a brief uh, overview saying that uh, we directly or indirectly represent something about 560 institutions. Uh, I will get to the differences uh, later on because uh, obviously the, the main uh, uh, visible providers of this type of education are universities of applied sciences, but they don't exist in every country. So the situation across Europe is uh, different. When we started uh, thinking about the agenda and we, when we sort of uh, were asking for moving further with the recognition of prior learning, we took some challenges into mind. Well, I think all of us are aware of changing pattern of jobs, of qualifications, uh, sort of a need for upskilling, reskilling, much more flexible uh, manpower. And I think especially this year probably proved uh, that there will be even more changes which will remain for the next, uh, next year. So our main conclusion is supported also by the view of uh, the leaders. I have to say that we had a, a discussion about how do we see the future uh, pattern for uh, universities, and in our case, especially for universities of applied sciences. And we have a forum in which we try to bring the top leaders of uh, European universities of applied sciences to discuss informally how do they see the different uh, aspects. And we asked them, how would you define the future university in one word? And in fact, this is what came out of that. It's nothing about uh, knowledge, uh, not that much about the research or the activities. It's about openness, diversity, uh, engagement, uh, sort of clear mission. So I, I think that indicates already the, the move in which uh, we have to operate. And this was confirmed by the colleagues, uh, uh, well, by a chance, uh, Vice President of Eurasia, Ulf Ehlers, who did the survey with the experts on defining what would be the f drivers of the future higher education uh, uh, for the next uh, decade. And you, you can see also the reference for more details. And what they came up after a few rounds of uh, clarification, that there will be much stronger fo focus on future skills, uh, there will be much more attention to multi-institutional pathways, flexibility and partnerships. There will be definitely more attention to sort of engaging into the lifelong learning concept and more personalization of academic learning. And in all these aspects, we see the recognition of prior learning or recognition of whatever other achievement and uh, experience as absolutely crucial point for allowing that and for connecting the, the individual institutions from uh, different sectors even, probably also considering the cooperation between public and private uh, institutions. That was for the background, and uh, 
I will try to go briefly through the results of uh, what we got uh, in the survey, uh, uh, which was uh, done at the end of the last year and the beginning of this year. And uh, I would have a few comments. You can see that there is a strong representation of two countries, thanks to the partners from these countries, uh, Ireland and uh, Sweden. I believe that we also managed to reach all the Icelandic higher education institutions, but we hope to have much wider coverage uh, of, from Europe. Uh, this uh, didn't happen, but I think we can take it as some indication of, uh, of trends, but not take the, the data as uh, totally statistically bulletproof. It's more like uh, the input for our further discussion. We try to respect the diversity of higher education, so you can see that there are represented universities, universities of applied sciences, other higher education institutions, colleges, etc. And we also man managed to cover all the qualification levels. I will show uh, the result uh, in the next slide. Majority of people had uh, some experience with the recognition of prior learning, so we can take it as the, the, the results are based on really expert uh, views. You can see that the distribution of uh, where the, the respondents uh, sort of, uh, performed the recognition of prior learning is mostly within the first cycle and second cycle. Uh, I guess that the short cycle is to some extent underrepresented also because it's not uh, offered by all the institutions. We see that uh, this may be one of the main dynamic uh, segments uh, for that together with the ongoing discussion on even smaller units like micro-credentials and uh, other alignments within the lifelong learning uh, provisions. And we asked the same question uh, like uh, Anders just uh, asked the, the participants. And indeed, the main uh, drivers or main, uh, <clears throat> main elements for sort of integrating or focusing on lifelong learning is strengthening lifelong learning and employability and better access to higher education and inclusion. Far the most, Although, as you see in the comment uh, at, the, at the bottom, there were some slight differences between the universities and universities of applied sciences, where universities of applied sciences put more emphasis on access and employability, uh, probably addressing uh, also wide uh, diversified uh, group of learners. Uh, we know that uh, the, the learners of, uh, of uh, universities of applied sciences come from a little bit different background in most of the countries. And uh, universities uh, put more emphasis on sort of uh, enhancing the diversity of the student population. There were also few comments saying that, well, the main driver is because it's driven, uh, it's uh, required by the policy or legislation. So it is basically the legal uh, requirement uh, for the higher education institutions. We asked about the uh, regulations at uh, national level and institutional level for different uh, types for sort of granting access to higher education to the credits and for both. And you can see that in most of the cases, uh, this is not that much uh, of an issue, but there's still a room for improvement. But again, we should bear in mind that this was uh, very much dominated by the responses from uh, countries which are well advanced Ireland and uh, Sweden to some extent. I have to say that uh, our regret is also that we wouldn't have uh, got the input from other countries which are on a uh, substantial uh, advanced level like uh, Netherlands, uh, France, uh, Belgium, but uh, there would be probably a chance uh, later on. When we ask for the challenges for uh, uh, different uh, for both uh, different approaches to higher education. I think they come basically very similar. And as I said, it's not statistically bulletproof uh, survey. So I think what we can take uh, of that is that, and I think it's a very positive uh, view. It's basically not uh, people complaining about the lack of legal frameworks, although for gaining uh, the credits, the, the sort of the attention to legal framework was uh, so stronger. And especially when we read through the comments later on, there was much more uh, requirements for, for having some sort of guidelines, having some policy, having some uh, framework in which the institutions would be able to operate. But the main issue is the awareness understanding by public what they can gain through a recognition of prior learning and at some mo at the same moment the capacity within the institutions uh, to deal with the recognition of prior learning uh, to uh, achieve some coherence achieve some uh, 
expert capacity to, to deal with the specific requirements of the recognition of prior learning and uh, the consistency of uh, decisions. Obviously, there were comments about the workload and the duration of the process, and we will get to that uh, when uh, I will have a few comments on uh, funding. When we asked about the different uh, stages of recognition of prior learning, again, you can see that uh, whether it's very much or somewhat, uh, the, the main challenges are within the documentation and assessment uh, of, uh, of uh, the documentation and uh, uh, the <coughs> candidate's uh, qualification and in identification uh, of the opportunity. Not that much with the certification itself, although there would be probably some uh, specific issues and uh, we sh still should uh, try to pay attention to what may be the, the, the barriers to be removed. We ask for the financial aspect of recognition of prior learning because I remember from the past uh, events and past uh, discussions within Bologna uh, process that there were different arrangements uh, across the different countries. So the, the Dutch approach would be substantially different from the French approach. We can see that the Swedish, and that's why I left the country uh, reports, we can see that the Irish approach is uh, somewhat different from Sweden where the Swedish uh, colleagues have uh, declared that there are basically no financial uh, uh, requirements uh, uh, and the, the Irish colleagues have seen some, uh, some issues with the, with the finance. When we asked uh, about the estimate, because it's very difficult to do that, we just asked about the expert estimate uh, whether the costs would uh, equal to maximum half of the expenditures for the relevant study block uh, in uh, reality or by uh, government funding or less than 10 percent uh, it is uh, if there is any fee it is maximum 50 percent of uh, adequate study cost uh, often much lower but still i think we should pay attention to the fact that this may be a burden for the applicants and we still should pay some attention to how to help those who may face that as the main uh, obstacle in their learning pathway. There were comments that there are very rare financial incentives. We don't know that many uh, details about that. In some cases, I think it is uh, compensated by the government grant for study, but not necessarily always. And I think there were not that many financial incentives uh, for the applicants to go through the process. So there were a number of comments as well. If, uh, there could be uh, some support for the applicants, some support for going through the process. We were wondering how much uh, there is evidence on the progress, success, uh, and achievements within uh, the recognition of prior learning. This seems to be the case both on national level and uh, institutional level, but still a number of institutions said that they don't collect the data. This is something they have to do. And even those who declared that they pay attention to data said that they should improve the system. And uh, the similar, uh, it's, uh, the recognition of prior learning is integrated in the quality assurance, but there were a number of requests whether there would be more developed uh, guidelines, more sharing experience and inspiration, how to do that uh, within the institutional policies. So if I can sum up the results, the policy and legal national frameworks uh, would be uh, appreciated at the national level, some even commented at the European level. Uh, that probably also refers to uh, the fact that not always people are aware on the, of uh, the European guidelines or don't find them uh, at the moment relevant for higher education. But the main issues is uh, awareness raising, promotion of the opportunity, awareness raising among the academic community and policymakers, capacity development uh, within the institutions, peer learning and good practices, uh, developing the internal institutional policies and uh, procedures. There were several comments uh, that we should also pay attention to different uh, requirements of, uh, uh, for example, STEM programs and uh, business studies and humanities and uh, healthcare programs that there might be the different uh, approaches and, uh, and different uh, opportunities. There may be attention paid to how to uh, recognize the different uh, volume of, uh, of learning, especially now with the sort of uh, starting debate on micro-credentials. I think this will become quite uh, important and a reflection of a recognition of prior learning in uh, funding. 
what we see as the request for the European uh, Commission and European level that there would be quite an interest in a sort of finding a way how the those engaged can exchange their experience in peer learning, learning from good cases, developing some common guidelines. So I think uh, this is quite a nice input for next uh, Erasmus uh, Plus planning. That's uh, all from my side. I would like to thank all those who have uh, responded. We are still trying to sum up the results. Um, by my last words, uh, I would like to thank all the partners for the promotion, but I would also like to promote a little bit of uh, Russia activity. So if you would be interested in following what we do within the professional higher education, for example, issues on quality, on work-based learning, etc., please follow us on the website or uh, look at uh, the social media. That's all from my side. I hope I managed to keep the volume of uh, participants. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Um, the number of participants actually raised during your presentation, um, <laughs> but we lost a little bit of, uh, <laughs> of time. Um, are there any questions? I think we could uh, at least have, uh, if there are one question, we could ask that to Michelle. And um, do you do that in the Q&A function? Uh, so if there are any questions, we could ask Michelle. Otherwise, we will, we will continue. Um, yes, well, let's continue then without further ado. We will get um, overviews from two, um, well, two national perspectives um, from uh, participants in this, uh, in the project. Um, first, we will uh, get a presentation from uh, Barbara Birke, Head of Department of Analysis and Report from uh, uh, Acru, Acru Astra. And later on, we will get from Durdica, Senior Advisor, Minister of Science and Education in Croatia. But um, we'll start with Barbara. Uh, so please, Barbara and Federica, will you start the presentation? Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Anders, for inviting us, AQ Austria, uh, to present uh, our experiences with uh, an implementation process uh, in Austria. I would like to give a short presentation on why and also how uh, this process was developed uh, in, in Austria and of course uh, still has been uh, developed because we have not finished yet. So next slide please. Uh, yes, I would like to, to start uh, with the council recommendation that Anders uh, has mentioned before. I don't have to explain it uh, um, any further but um, it was the first, it was not the first uh, impulse in Austria for RPL, for implementing RPL, but it was a very important uh, starting uh, point for us. And uh, parallel to this, uh, on national uh, level in Austria, and uh, yeah, following uh, the recommendations, we have developed uh, a national strategy, uh, the Austrian Lifelong Learning Strategy, called uh, LLL 2020, which says, besides others, um, acquired skills and competences, regardless of where they were acquired, shall be recognized and certified for placing, and this now is most important, non-formal and informal education processes on an equal, equal level with formal education processes. Then another very important uh, step in Austria was um, in 2017, the national strategy on the social dimension of higher education, uh, which also refers to uh, LLL 2020 strategy and the importance of uh, uh, RPL in Austria. And those two uh, strategies um, are very important uh, for us because we have um, a very strong vocational education sector in Austria and therefore highly qualified people who um, have not um, had their first uh, academic degree but might strive for academic qualification. And also we have a very strong social selection on access to higher education and had rather low numbers of people with academic degrees in Austria, which has um, become better uh, so far, which has already become better. So next slide, please. Um, so why was it difficult to get uh, those implementation processes started in Austria? 
we uh, unfortunately still have uh, different legal provisions in Austria for four different uh, sectors, uh, which ranges from nearly no RPL of non-formal and informal learning at public universities to uh, RPL is mandatory at universities of applied sciences, the so-called Fachhochschulen, since 1994. And then regulations that come in between somewhere. So we are uh, at the moment uh, starting to get uh, new regulations on RPL and we hope that they yeah, might um, uh, be successful. But uh, before that, uh, we have or had uh, little experience with RPL in Austria at higher education institutions. Therefore, little knowledge on procedures, on quality assured procedures, and also uh, little or <laughs> I can say no trust in, uh, in RPL uh, at higher education institutions. So um, some years ago, AT Austria was commissioned by the ministry to start this uh, RPL uh, implementation process and to support and prom promote the um, implementation process. And um, why AT Austria is on my next slide. Thank you. Um, AQ Austria um, is uh, the only, <coughs> sorry, the only uh, quality assurance agency in Austria and uh, we work cross sectoral, which means that we, we work together with public and private universities, Fachhochschulen, teacher training colleges, etc. And of course, as an, a quality assurance agency, our focus is on quality assured processes, at least when, when we uh, recommend them. And we uh, are in, uh, in the lucky position that we can put also uh, a focus on RPL within and the quality assured RPL procedures within the accreditation processes uh, the higher education institutions undergo with AQ Austria. Um, when we started those uh, processes, the, and <laughs> still it is like that, the biggest challenge is to build trust in the quality of uh, RPL and uh, in its procedures, so to develop quality assured um, RPL processes. And so I would like to explain uh, why we did it the way we did. Um, we started uh, several project groups uh, together with higher education institutions that uh, represented all sectors uh, I mentioned before, so all four higher education sectors. Uh, and we started in 2015 and let's say it's an open end because we have not finished uh, the process and also the projects uh, yet. And we built those project groups in order to develop applicable recommendations for RPL procedures together. Applicable means they have to be useful uh, and sensible for higher education institutions and they uh, the, the projects partners should be committed to them. And uh, we invited experts, uh, external experts uh, in the field of RPL to our project, to our workshops and seminars from experienced uh, EU member countries, mainly from fin Finland, Germany and Ireland, in, uh, in order to learn from their experiences. And that was very important and, and helpful. And we also have been in close contact to the ministry uh, in order to move the legal basis for RPL forward. And I mentioned before that I think we all together uh, have been very successful uh, in that aspect. And um, at different points uh, of the project, uh, the ministry provided different forms of uh, support uh, to the higher education institutions. Um, whether uh, in the form of um, uh, funding for consolation to the higher education institutions via external, uh, external exports or for uh, implementing pilot projects uh, as two or three uh, universities are starting them uh, now. And then, of course, uh, we have been carrying out permanent activities. We as AQ Austria, also together uh, with higher education institutions or, for example, in, in, this, uh, in the current RPLIP project, 
in order to um, provide information on um, RPL procedures to support higher education institutions and to promote the implementation of um, RPL. So this was uh, my or AQ Austria's point of view on, on the topic of uh, RPL, but much more important is why do Austrian higher education institutions implement uh, RPL? And I uh, asked my, two of my project partners before, Susanna Boltrino, uh, whom I don't know whether she's uh, present at the moment, but Christina Paulus is, and uh, to put it very short, they say mainly that they don't want to waste skills and time of students they already bring along, along or they bring along uh, various competences, uh, Christina mentioned that she wants to contribute to quality assurance permeability and uh, via, via implementing RPL procedures uh, tries to counteract current and uh, expected unemployment in Austria, which became much more important, of course, in the context of uh, COVID-19 at the moment. So, um, yeah, why? Uh, would you contact us um, if you have any further questions, of course, uh, but also if you have important information you would like to share with us, uh, yes, please contact us at AQ Austria. Thank you very much. Okay, thank, thank you, Barbara. Um, we've got a question um, from the Q&A. Is there a reason why RPL is more developed in universities of applied sciences rather than other universities? <laughs> yeah, Would you have a... Yeah. Um, the main reason is that um, the uh, Fachhochschulen are professional oriented. Uh, Arthur Mettinger might explain it uh, later on a little more in detail. And also because uh, the regulation, so relevant regulations were laid down by law from the very beginning. So mm. they could uh, RPL from the very beginning, which, is not, which does not apply to universities. Yes, I think this will be a, a, a question to the panel, maybe if we have um, time for it because it is it is an interesting question mm -hmm. okay thank you barbara and now we'll con uh, continue with to uh, durdicha so um please go ahead and uh, and um explain the creation um setting hello everyone i just need to also start screen sharing mm. So, uh, as you will see from my presentation, as Austria and Croatia are fairly similar higher education systems with somewhat a similar tradition, we do have uh, many things overlapping in our two systems. So, first a little bit about the challenges that we see in uh, our higher education. So, we still have a very low graduation rate. It used to be very low before we introduced uh, the Bologna free cycles. Uh, it was below 50% and today it's at 60%, so still not great. And we have a number of people uh, who start higher education and uh, come very far in their studies, up to the last year of their studies, only to start working and never graduate. So they never receive any qualification for all the work they did uh, in higher education. Uh, then we have demographic issues, like most of the Eastern European and European countries in general. Uh, so, uh, already, even though the capacities of higher education have been decreasing by a plan in the last couple of years, there is still more room in higher education than there are students. And uh, uh, the higher education institutions, particularly the universities, are not really looking at older people uh, as a real target group for them. And uh, this will have to change if they will want to uh, have sustainable study programs in the future. And the final thing, which is a huge issue in Croatia, is skills mismatch. Uh, so even though uh, we have a growing number of people with higher education qualifications, many of those people do not find work immediately after their studies. 
uh, and uh, are uh, forced to look for work in other professions, which means that they end up having a career in something completely different from what they studied and have no formal qualification for the profession they're actually doing. And why do you think RPL would be the thing that could help solving these problems? Uh, one thing is shorter time of studying. Uh, in our higher education law, it says, it's uh, clearly stated that any student uh, can request a, 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 for a shorter period of studying, for example, to take two uh, years in a single academic year. However, a normal and very excellent student actually do that. And um, it's not really applicable right now to people who are mature students and have a lot of work experience. And of course, it's not just about the time of studying, it's also about the cost of studying. And uh, very often uh, in the ministry, we have inquiries of adults who would love to uh, complete a course they started once or uh, change their career in a different direction. Uh, but they uh, are not able to afford more than a year of work, for example. And currently our higher education institutions are not well adapted to such requests. And our ultimate goal here would be to ensure that higher education is more open in Croatia in general. Uh, on the one hand, uh, we, uh, are, uh, we have been focusing a lot in the last couple of years on the social dimension because we know from the service that uh, adults, people who work, people with children and other people who don't really have time to study are uh, a much more underrepresented in Croatian higher education than in other comparable systems in Europe. Uh, and also we think this would not only benefit these people, but also the higher education institutions uh, that would uh, become able to offer shorter courses and to offer uh, qualifications uh, in a shorter time or through micro credentials, which are now being introduced at the European level. So they could actually really diversify their educational offer, which would have various benefits for them. And uh, I have to say that in Croatia, we struggled a bit with introducing RPL. Uh, I would say we started, uh, we had some projects before that, but in 2011, uh, we uh, actually adopted the qualifications framework law and changed the law on higher education to make the use of learning outcomes obligatory, which is uh, what really enabled the introduction of RPL because there's no really RPL without competence approach and the use of learning outcomes. However, we were immediately, just like Barbara said, afraid of RPL. Uh, there was little trust uh, in ourselves, basically, and we wanted to have a very regulated system with a specific uh, national ordinance, with a nationally centralized database. So at any point, anyone could check if the person actually deserved RPL or not. However, this led us nowhere uh, because uh, even though higher education institutions are autonomous and have been able to introduce RPL, they were reluctant to do it without all these centralized uh, documents and systems. So actually very little happened between 2011 and 2018. Uh, which is why uh, somewhere around 2018, uh, we simply changed our mind. We realized that uh, this hyper-regulation may be made for perfect RPL procedures in theory, but there were none in practice. Uh, so we changed the law the, to make it completely clear that uh, higher education institutions are autonomous, are obliged by a number of European documents, including the European standards and guidelines uh, for quality assurance, to um, perform RPL procedures, and that the ministry supports them in doing so. So uh, as the ministry, we decided to focus on incentives. So uh, we have been starting calls for project proposals that include RPL and we are still writing some right now. Uh, we, off we use the support of European Commission for this project and our parallel Sideral project uh, to fund uh, certain workshops and activities. And this was really helpful for us. 
uh, and uh, we established uh, a rather informal uh, group of higher education institutions at the ministry uh, with representatives who are specifically interested in RPL and we are now working on the guidelines similar to what uh, Austria has already published and we can see that already a number of our institutions have adopted RPL ordinances and other relevant documents and that uh, finally something is starting to happen with RPL. So definitely, just like Austria realized, we understand that once you have some basis in the law, it's really crucial to do all these informal activities rather than focus on the legal aspects uh, of introducing RPL. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Durdicha. Um, any questions or or clarifications I would ask for. Uh, now is your chance. Uh, Durdicha and Barbara is not part of the panel. So if there aren't any question, we, questions, we continue to, um, to the panel. Okay, good. Thank you very much, Barbara and Durdicha. Well, now we continue to um, the panel discussion. Um, in the panel, we will reflect, uh, reflect on the reasons why higher education institutions uh, should work with RPL. And uh, the basic outline of the panel is that we let the panelists present themselves and comment on the why questions. Uh, and then we will open for questions from you. And um, I will also uh, ask a few questions. Um, and like I said before, um, ask questions in the Q&A um, function. Uh, and to you, uh, dear panelists, um, thank you very much for accepting being part of this panel. Uh, we're very happy to have you. Um, I will let you present yourselves uh, instead of me doing it. So um, I will continue to ask you um, and present yourself, uh, explain in which way you're involved in RPL, and also comment on the question why higher education institutions should work with recognition of prior informal and non-formal learning. So there are these two things. Um, I, we follow the, the order which you are mentioned in the program. So we'll start with uh, uh, Arthur Mettinger. Please. Okay, so good afternoon. My name is Arthur Mettinger. Uh, my um, academic background, in fact, is, is English linguistics. And I have been serving in, in major managerial capacities in higher education institutions for 20 years now. First at University of Vienna for 12 years as vice rector, and now for the past eight years as uh, rector and vice rector at Austria's largest university of applied sciences. And um, the question has been raised before, why might um, a recognition of prior learning in Austria be more interesting for the universities of applied sciences? I think one of the reasons may be, uh, and I can just give you the example of FA Campus Wien University of Applied Sciences, is that the uh, University of Applied Sciences offer uh, academic profession-oriented higher education, uh, which means that we are in constant uh, contact with the labor market, with the enterprises, uh, with the employers. Uh, and we always, when we develop curricula uh, and when we revise curricula, we always try to find out which skills uh, the various professions need so that we can academically educate, not just train, but academically educate our students. Um, and in, in answering the question why uh, RPL should be interesting, I think there are, I would, I would want to refer to two main drivers. One driver is the lifelong learning uh, strategy or process, which my institution has. Uh, as part of the institutional strategy. Um, and of course, there is the, the social inclusion on the one hand, but there is another interesting factor that has maybe not been mentioned um, too much uh, today. And this is the age factor. Uh, more than half of our students are extra occupational students. So they, they are in the workforce and, and they study alongside or they are more advanced in age 
and have a lot of work experience, not necessarily academic work experience, but work experience. And I think that uh, in order to offer good chances for this group of people, uh, RPL is absolutely, is absolutely necessary. I'm not saying that it's working very easily, but at least, uh, at least my institution has been trying to implement that and Susanna Bolduino, I think will tell you more about that on the 4th of November. Uh, and the second, I think the second driver that may be uh, still in the, in, the, in the starting phase is I think the new skills initiative that, that has been launched recently. And, and it's been mentioned, uh, Dulitza mentioned uh, reskilling and upskilling. And again, this is something uh, that higher education institutions will have to observe much more than in the past, and where again, RPL is, is an absolutely necessary instrument. I'll stop at that for the time being because um, I think the other panelists should also have the floor. Hey, thank you, Arthur. Uh, and Karma? Uh, hello, <laughs> my name is Karma Arroyo. I'm the executive director of UCAN, the European University Continuum Education Network. Uh, UCAN has been involved in uh, recognition of prior learning and um, validation of prior learning for as long as I remember. I've been working in UCAN for 20 years, over 20 years, so I, I think that it's always been there. We have advocated uh, uh, for validation of uh, prior learner since the early 90s. And uh, you can uh, encourage and enable this, uh, small groups working together uh, in a small projects. And then in the year 2001, we actually coordinated as, uh, the, the academic aspect of a project called Transfine which uh, um, investigated the feasibility of a new European architecture for recognition, transfer and accumulation of qualifications. And uh, we also developed a set of principles, methods and tools. And uh, after that uh, project with the results, we had a, a next project called Refine, which actually tested all these tools and, uh, and, and see what was happening. After that came another project called Observable, which collected more than 100 documents regarding validation of uh, prior learning from 27 different countries. And uh, after that, we had Observable Net, which was about uh, uh, focusing on the bottom-up approach uh, for validation and uh, also how the professionals of validation were affected and how to help them and also how world-based learning uh, could benefit from uh, validation as well. And uh, recently we've had uh, this uh, project called VINS, which uh, recently has finished and which was focusing on um, developing tools uh, for professionals who work on the validation area with uh, newcomers, with uh, refugees, migrants, people who are not European citizens or are in the process of becoming. And of course, the documentation from these people are very different from what we know in our countries and it's a challenge. Um, I would like to include in my presentation uh, some reflection. I think that if universities want to be uh, more inclusive, if the universities want to be more open and open their doors to non-standard students, it doesn't matter if they are newcomers, migrants or not, it could be actually our citizens, you know, born and brought in our countries, but uh, students who maybe have never been in university and as an adult decide to go to university, I think uh, the validation or the recognition of prior learning is totally a key tool, essential, uh, is of great value really. It's important to preserve quality in universities. The quality of curriculum is of course essential because otherwise why universities are there. But uh, it's equally important to acknowledge the skills and the competences of the of the participants, of the students, the mature students. Um, uh, 
also because uh, it actually gives them a chance to demonstrate that their experience, their path, is being worth something. It's not like a put into a, a, a wheel and gone, but it's, they learn a lot during their past years. Um, so I, I really and truly believe that validation is a, a very uh, useful tool that makes uh, fair, it, it gives fair, a fair chance to all the students and credit to students to grow up into it. Also, uh, my last point is that uh, um, validation of uh, non-formal informal learning or recognition of prior learning gives us the facility at the university level to put the student in the center and to build the curricula in a way that it suits them. And I totally agree with something that you said at the beginning. And it's uh, the motto, I think. Nobody should be required to study something that they already know. I totally agree. If you already know something, why you have to sit another exam, yet another exam. So uh, this is briefly what I wanted to explain. I can obviously talk more about beans or our experience. Just ask me. <laughs> yep. Thank you, Karma. And uh, now we continue to, uh, to Irene to present yourself and uh, in which way you're involved in, in RPL and also why higher education institutions should be involved in, in recognition of prior learning. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anders. Um, so in terms of presenting myself, actually, my background is in electronic engineering, uh, microwave telecommunications, so um, yeah, quite, quite a different background. And that might um, echo well in terms of what I'm going to say about supporting people's transitions. Um, but I work in Cork Institute of Technology, uh, which is about to become a technological university in the south of Ireland. And in Cork Institute of Technology, which had its basis in a regional technical college, very much focused on um, skills for the region for supporting the development and growth of the region. So really um, validation, recognition, uh, upkeep of skills, um, ensuring the matching of outputs to the requirements of the, the local community, society, industry base has always been in the DNA of CIT. Um, so just in terms of where we've come from, I suppose we started working with um, RPL formally through some European projects around 1996. And as you saw in the earlier little video clip that, that Anders showed, um, last year we celebrated 20 years of formally integrating recognition of prior learning into the institution's processes. So it went from being a peripheral project, and I think that's quite often the journey it, it goes through in many institutions, to being formally integrated into the centre of the institution. So just talking about why, um, we've heard a lot today about the um, equity of access to education, about the importance of supporting people in their learning journey, and about the individuality of each person's learning and their journey. Um, what I currently do in CIT is I'm head of what's called the CIT Extended Campus, which is a boundary spanning organization really. So for over a decade now, I have worked exclusively at that interface between external organizations, and that's all organizations, whether they're public, private, not-for-profit, whether they're micro, small, medium, or multinational corporations. I've worked at the interface between those organizations and our academia in terms of our research, in terms of our uh, training, education, uh, teaching, learning, and assessment. So really what has happened is is that recognition of prior learning has become a core building block of those relationships with external organizations. And why? The reason why the underpinning philosophy is that for us in CIT, the workplace itself is a valid and valuable center of learning not just for the application of knowledge, but for the generation of new knowledge. And that link between practice, reflection and learning is important. And it relates to all workplaces. And more importantly, it relates to all levels of learning. We're not just saying that you can generate skills or competences in the workplace, but you can also generate new knowledge. 
And if you start from that premise, then the logical next steps are that the challenge is for higher education providers to recognize and value evidence of that learning in the appropriate context, in the context of, of programs or awards. And that ensures that just like you said, Anders, that learners don't have to repeat learning they've attained. It broadens access to education. It contributes to the more thoughtful linking of learning and work. And it contributes to our responsiveness to the huge challenges that are out there um, that require really pivoting to, to respond to national and international challenges. And what we do in the extended campus is we work really closely with employers to support those in the workplace to reflect on and recognize their own learning in the context of a destination award and to present evidence of that learning. And that brings us to work, for instance, to develop customized awards for cohorts of learning learners, taking into account the existing formal, non-formal, informal learning to ensure that all of those building blocks are harnessed to contribute to an overall qualification. And we work not just with the employers, but with the learners in a constructivist, um, I suppose, co-creation type model. Um, one of the projects, for instance, we're working on is uh, called Fit for Factories of the Future, where we're looking at the challenges of digital transformations and the impact of that on the skills of people who are currently in that manufacturing workplace. Um, another side of that picture is the planned acquisition of learning outcomes within the practice domain through designed work-based learning pathways. And in lots of ways, that's the other side of the RPL coin, building in the workplace as a center of learning, the campus extending into the workplace and the workplace extending into the campus. And for example, one of the places we're doing that is with the Advanced Center for Research Training, building work placement into doctoral education pathways. So again, overcoming at all levels, those barriers or the lack of trust um, in the workplace as a center of learning. And to do this, can I just as finally say, you need real partnerships built on relationships, realistic expectations and resources on both sides. And our role in CIT Extended Campus is to identify opportunities and support good practice. And through the years, we have worked hard to build a better understanding of the benefits of RPL and work-based learning, not just in the, in the campus, but in the workplace within our partner base, and particularly to support workforce development in responding to challenging work and international circumstances. I, I'll stop there, Anders, in, in respect of time. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Irene. Yeah, it's really impressive your work uh, together with industry that you, you do. It's really a comprehensive um, idea of what you want to achieve. Um, okay, let's continue to, uh, to Una, Una Strand Widerstotir uh, from Iceland. Um, so please. Thank you. I shall try to keep it brief so we might actually have some discussion at the end because I think that would be benefit everybody. So my name is Una Widerstotir. I work in the Ministry of Education, Science and Culture in Iceland and I'm responsible for higher education and science there. But before that I worked as an academic for a long time in the UK. So. Uh, uh, I have a background in anatomy and 3D shape analysis and paleontology. So we've all got all sorts of different backgrounds. Um, in Iceland, actually, uh, although we've come reasonably far with recognition of prior learning at the secondary level, really we were doing very badly at the, the higher education level. And so, I mean, we wanted to be, be part of this project to try to really get moving forward. Um, so what we're concentrating on is not so much access, because for us, access is something that we deal with generally with the, with the secondary, um, secondary school, is a problem of the secondary school tier, uh, but rather for, for recognition of prior learning as part of, of your degree or part of your qualification. So that's, that, that's the sort of point we came in from. And actually for us, it is also very important that we have a very diverse um, student body. I mean, we already have quite an old student body in Iceland. We have people with families, etc. But we also felt a need to have more people with experience of the workplace within the student force because it brings a much more varied environment. And of course, in Iceland, we don't have any, any uh, applied science uh, higher education institutions. We only have universities. And so therefore, we felt that that, that, that would be beneficial to us. And thirdly, I think there was a um, some resistance, I think, in higher education for the recognition of prior learning, for the fact that you could actually bring something from the workplace that might be the equivalent of something you might learn in higher education. And I think that is a, it's a mindset and a, that we need to change. And I think 
we can do that um, through actually developing some very transparent procedures uh, whereby we apply uh, the recognition of prior learning. And so for us, we had a, a problem also with capacity building, really just build up the capacity within the staff to be able to do this and build up uh, a model that we could apply to really institutions with a very limited workforce. So we, we don't have uh, access to masses and masses of people to do this work. We really have to uh, develop a model that works for all of us. And so we've uh, taken part with um, representatives both from uh, our uh, higher education institutions that deal with culture uh, and uh, arts and also from our sort of traditional University of Iceland in particular and we the thought being that if we can develop a model that worked for both of these then they might apply for the um, the whole community as a whole and the system as a whole and then we have a, a sort of background group of people from all sorts of uh, from all the other higher education institutions that work with us and I think we've learned a lot from this procedure we've, we've really uh, enjoyed working as part of this project and I think we've come to realize that you cannot just pick something that works somewhere else you have to always adapt it to your system to the situation that you've got and in that way uh, you can build up a system that works well uh, for you as a country and for the institutions and for the students that you're trying to deal with so I'll leave it at that and hope we can get on to some discussion soon thank you Thank, thank you, Una. Um, anyone wants to comment uh, what anyone said? Um, otherwise, I'll continue with the question from, um, um, from the attendees. Um, we've got a question um, in the Q&A. Um, from your own experience, do you notice that RPL puts increasing importance on transversal competences or is still or is it still very much focused on technical or job specific skills um, maybe i pass that on first to, to arthur do you have a uh, something to say uh, about that from my from my experience i could not say that one is is more important than the other i think it's it depends very much on the uh, on the curriculum, and it depends very much on the on the on the on the field. Yeah, in fact, anyone else wants to comment on that? It sort of relates to the the previous question uh, uh, about uh, that the um, universities of applied sciences uh, were more inclined to work with RPL than universities, possibly. But Irene, do you? Yeah, thank, thanks, Anders. Um, I, I think it's an interesting question, but I suppose what, what you have to think about is um, that recognition of prior learning, that pathway is individual. And that's what goes back quite often to our conversation around resources and effort that's required here, because it is individual. So ultimately, in answer to that question, I would say that the in Ireland, at, at least, the um, skills, the learning, the, the competence, the knowledge that the person can bring, can evidence that they've gained in the past, will be considered in the context of the destination award. So a really important building block for recognition of prior learning is that well-developed and well-understood national framework of qualifications and learning outcomes type approach to program development. Then you have um, measures against which you can bring that learning. And for us, that learning can be quite specific, discipline specific, quite deep and intense knowledge around a particular thing. It can be skills oriented or it can be much broader set of skills but in any case, it has to be relevant, current, authenticated and evidenced in the context of the destination program. So I think the answer is it could be all and any of those things because it is very much individual. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? Otherwise, we, um, I said earlier, we, we had one of the polls um, asking... Um, what are the drivers uh, for, for RPL? And I promised that we would come back to that uh, during the panel. Um, I think we could get the answers um, up again. Um, so we can see that the providing better access and inclusion in higher education, we, we heard, um, I think Carme mentioned that and, and um, more of you did. Uh, strengthening the lifelong learning, you have already mentioned. But uh, 
Are there any other thoughts that you uh, get when you see these results? Karma, is there something that you... Well, I, I actually think that um, this uh, technical drive, this uh, drive for employability is uh, very genuinely, I understand the situation uh, is like this. We, we need to find ways for employment. So it's a way of uh, finding uh, ways of uh, uh, upskilling people to have this and, and to get people out the unemployment. So, but I, I think that it shouldn't be like that only. It should be for anything. And not only because you are looking for unemployment, but also because you want to learn and you want to uh, get recognition for whatever you've learned in your life. If you know what I mean. Yeah. Anyone else want to comment? Una, do you wave? Uh, no, I mean, I, no, I came in uh, on a lot of this in what yes. I said earlier. I, I'm, I'm still, I'm still feeling a little bit uncomfortable with it, with the, with the uh, term upskilling of education. I, I, I really would rather talk about reskilling because I think, you know, a skill is a skill. Um, yes, just, I totally <laughs> agree. Yes. Yeah. I'm trying to use the European uh, vocabulary, but it, probably you're totally right about it. So I agree with you. I give it to you. I think it was interesting to me because I thought well, the, the question that's got 7% here on recruiting a sufficient pool of students, which when I saw it, I thought, what a strange thing to say. But then I listened to, to the, the talk from the Czech Republic and I realized, well, actually, we, we know, know from Croatia, we, re, we have this problem. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and, and that I thought was really interesting because we had that problem quite some time ago. Um, and then what we did was we, we had a massive drive to get people into education, also helped in many ways by, uh, by unemployment due to financial collapse and other things. Um, so we don't have that problem anymore. But I can see that, that it is interesting and it actually works together with, with this fact of getting different types of students in and having more inclusive higher education and a greater diversity. So I think that's really, really important. There's one that's... thing that we haven't really, um, um, well, it has been mentioned, but we haven't really discussed it uh, a lot. It's the um, uh, increased quality of higher education due to its focus on our learning outcomes. Um, we haven't really touched upon that, but um, do you have a, a comment on that, uh, Arthur? Well, I, I have a comment on that. Um, yeah. I think that without a well-established learning outcome approach, it's practically impossible to, to implement uh, recognition of prior learning. And I think that, that this is some, maybe this is something that makes it difficult for higher education people to go along with RPL. Um, because learning outcome approach means that you work outcome oriented rather than input oriented. And many academics, I'm, I, I dare say, are still very much input oriented and only what they input is is good or is is best quality and i think that this is something that uh, where a change in the in the mindset might uh, be necessary um i don't want to generalize it will be unfair but but some of the problems might be might be in there hmm. irene you you waved earlier would you like to Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I really think that uh, the 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 comment that that Arthur just made that that notion of like understanding that what the recognition of prior learning does for us in in higher education is it actually separates the locus of the acquisition of the knowledge, skill, and competence from the locus of the the assessment or the recognition or the certification or the validation, whatever words you want to use, and that the divorcing the the context in which the the, the learning has been acquired and gained, you know, it, it's quite a considerable leap to make um, from from the traditional, but but we're moving that way, or and I think that if nothing else, um, you know, teaching and learning, a focus on the professionalization of teaching and learning in third level over the last maybe two decades has, has really asked us to question how we assess. And, and all of that development has fed back into this notion of understanding learning that's evidenced in different ways. And 
the, when we speak about the kind of the drivers which you spoke about earlier, Anders, I, I think you have to, in your mind, separate out. There are drivers at a really internalized personal level for people to bring that uh, package of who they are, uh, their, their knowledge, their skill, their lifelong journey, their competences um, in all kinds of different ways and to, and to bring it and offer it up. Um, in some cases against a generic kind of qualification or in other cases against a spe specific qualification. And we, we mightn't call it upskilling. I think I read in the, in the chat here, I think it was Andrina proposed something like up qualifying, but, but essentially it is having that recognized. That's, that's what it's all about. We, we know it and we're bringing it to have it recognized in a context. And what's really important, learning outcomes focus is really important. A framework is really important, but a robust quality assurance mechanism so that there isn't a second class citizen type of um, view of, of qualifications gained or contributed to in this way is vital. And that's why for us, and I know for Austria, I've worked with, with AQ there and with Barbara there, the, the involvement of QQI in Ireland. These are really important parts of this picture because what we want to do is to, is to support the recognition, not in any way disadvantage this pathway, um, if you know what I mean. Thanks, Anders. But uh, I mean, this with the learning outcomes approach, it, it shouldn't be something new for the uh, for the higher education institution. That was introduced long time ago. Uh, Una, do you like to comment on that? I mean, you have a qualifications framework and you have the Dublin descriptors and everything. So, yeah, I mean, you have them. De facto, you, know. you have them. Doesn't mean that everybody knows how to use them. And I think, uh, I mean, there is, I mean, I've worked as an academic myself, and there is a, a certain retraining of academics required. And, and you, you can have all these frameworks, but if people are not actually have not mentally made that switch, mm. then, then all they're doing is ticking a box or writing a learning outcome. And I've done it myself when I was an academic. When they first came in, I thought, well, what am I showing? And then somebody pointed out to me, well, you actually have to show how, how you assess it. And I think for many academics, that's the difficult part. How are you actually assessing that the student has learned to do A, a B and C? And then to move on that you might actually be able to assess it in a different way from their learning that they've got somewhere else. I mean, that's a massive leap for academics to make, I think for many of them. And, uh, and for, I think for many, they just think, well, recognition of prior learning is something that... Um, a person who works in an office should be able to do for me and I shouldn't have to be you know then I just get the students in and they do they should be able to sit the class or do whatever they want to do but actually it is the person the academic who has to define well a what is it that you were meant to get out of this particular part of your qualification and how on earth can you demonstrate it and and that is a leap that we require not just in the recognition of prior learning but in higher education provision in general, I think, and it, we haven't quite got there yet. Oh. Yes, thank you. Uh, we could discuss this uh, for a long time. I, I can hear your enthusiasm. Uh, and um, But we're running out of time. Uh, Carmen, would you like to have a, a last um, uh, word on, on this before we, we end the panel? Or Not think really, I'm... Not really Anders, because I think that I totally agree with what they are saying. and. and... Mm nothing more to add thanks okay well time flies when you're having fun um it's uh, one minute to four uh i would like to thank you a lot for being um being part of this panel and uh, your um discussions there's one question from from the audience which we haven't uh answered maybe i will pass it on to you and see if you could maybe uh, answer it in writing later on but thank you very much uh, for this. I will end, uh, we will only take a minute or so um, to, to, to end this. Um, oops, sorry. So, um, I would just like to, to mention uh, upcoming events in this project. We will have a project dissemination conference in the spring 2021, hopefully in, in Stockholm, uh, if we are able to, to meet in person at that time. But um, please um, keep informed uh, by um, looking at this web page, the, the project web page. Um, 
And we will also have uh, another um, webinar in this series of recognition of prior learning in higher education. That seminar will uh, um, focus on, um, on how to do it, how to validate and recognize uh, prior informal and non-formal learning. During that seminar, we will um, get examples of, um, of how to do it, and um, both from people uh, within our project, uh, but then we will have a panel with people both within the project and, and outside uh, the project where we'll discuss these things. So um, please don't miss that. Um, you have the, um, the link in the, uh, in the presentation and I think uh, uh, Federica will also put the link in the, in the chat for you. It's on the 5th of November uh, 2020 and at half past two. So with that, I would like to thank you all um, for, um, for being with us. And I'm sorry for taking uh, two uh, <laughs> more minutes of your time uh, over time. So thank you very much and uh, see you on the 5th of November, I hope. Bye. Thanks, Anders. Bye.